up inside. Emily, what happened? I fell off the swing and broke my arm. I fell off swings a lot when I was little. Did you hurt your arm? My arm, my leg, my finger. Twice. My nose. <laughs> you fell a lot. She sure did. Can you wiggle your fingers? You know what? You didn't break your arm. Just bruise it a little. Can I go back to school? Sure can. Just wash that up, okay? You are a natural born caretaker, Lindy. Because <laughs> I can tell a bruise from a broken bow. Because you can make people feel better when they're hurt and scared. Just like you, Mama. Lindy, what brings you into town? I came to get my newspapers, and I thought I asked my best fella to take me lunch at the hotel. Uh, one of these days, somebody else is going to be your best fella. And I'm going to get just a little jealous. There may be another fella in my life someday. But you always be the best papa. That's worth the best meal the hotel has to offer. And you get to be so clever to wrap me around your old finger. By the way, I hear Dr. Jackson is looking for a new assistant. You mean it? Absolutely. I better get down there before somebody else gets the job. What about lunch? Another time, Papa. So much for being her best fella. Nothing in particular. Maybe I just wanted to give my beautiful wife some flowers. Mr. Davis, you do turn my head. I'm not to steal a kiss. You don't have to steal it. Grandma? Grandpa? Did you get all the eggs? You know, the Reds have a habit of laying in the barn. Did you check there? No. Stop lollygagging around. Come on, get to it. Yes, sir. <laughs> Dr. Jackson, I'm here for the assistant position. Oh, would you just hold on there, Belinda? I can't hire you. But I know sutures and basic first aid. I even learned a new wrapping technique for sprains that Dr. Usler recommends. Well, where'd you learn that? I read his book. I read a lot of medical books and newspaper articles. Everything I can get my hands on. Reading a few books doesn't make you qualified. Without proper medical training, all that book knowledge is useless. But I can learn. I already know more than anyone in Anderson Corner. Well, I don't doubt it. What I need is someone with solid patient experience. This is all I've ever wanted to do with my life. I could learn so much from you, Doc. Women aren't supposed to be doctors. What about marriage? I'm not getting married. Ever? Well, Doc, I'm... Women are meant to marry and have children, which is exactly what you'll do when the right man comes along. Trust me, marriage and a career in medicine will never work. I'm not giving up. Dr. Elizabeth Blackwell applied to 29 schools before she got accepted into Geneva College. Elizabeth Blackwell is the exception, not the rule. Now, Geneva College may accept your application, but I won't. Good day. Come on. came into town to pick up some supplies from the general store. I thought I would stop by to see if the five of you would like to come out to dinner tonight. Well, that sounds good. I'm always happy to eat at your house instead of mine. Oh, really? Well, not that Missy's cooking isn't good. It's interesting. It's all right, Zach. I love my daughter dearly, but I have to admit, she does not take after her mama when it comes to cooking. Excuse me, Sheriff. What can I do for you? I'm Drew Simpson. My uncle was Hank Simpson. Hank was a fine man. My condolences. Well, thank you, Mr. Davis. Clark Davis. Our place is next to Hank's. And, uh, he was a good neighbor. Unfortunately, I didn't have the opportunity to meet Uncle Hank, living so far away and all. Where are you from? New York City. New York City. 
I bet that's a sight different than our little town. Oh, yes. Well, I mean, it's, it's much bigger and a little bit more cultured and sophisticated. This place is clearly rather rustic. <laughs> <laughs> rustic. <laughs> <clears throat> anyway, the, uh, the stage driver suggested I ask you for directions to my uncle's place. Now, I can do better than that. Got my buckboard right outside. I'll take you out there myself. Well, that's awful kind of you, Mr. Davis. Chair. Good day. Yeah, Water settled in after your uncle passed. I'm afraid they didn't take care of your place properly. I hoped it would be in good enough shape to sell right away. You're not staying? Certainly not. Take a set of work to make it presentable. Pack rat's gonna settle into those walls if you don't get those holes patched up. You know anyone I could hire to do that? You don't want to do the work yourself? I just graduated from law school. I know all about writs and torts and the right of habeas corpus, but nothing about working on a farm. I'd be happy to help you. Would you? Well, thank you. I I'll pay you, of course. Oh, it's mighty generous, but no thanks. I can't let you work for nothing, Mr. Davis. You'd be allowing me to repay a debt to a good friend? And I accept. Good. Please sit down. Thank you. It's great that you could come in today. I really appreciate it. It's no problem. It's nice to see you. We haven't had a chance to talk since you moved here, Mrs. Kent. Please call me Sadie. Uh, Caleb is a bright boy, but he's very behind for his age, especially in his reading and writing. He isn't doing his homework, and he said that you and his father won't help him with it. I'm afraid my husband, Charles, don't hold much with schoolwork. And... I'm sure you understand the importance of a good education. I know how bad it feels when you don't have one. I only got through the second grade before I had to stay home with my mom, take care of the younger kids. The fact is, I can only read a few words in this paper. So it's not that you won't help him, it's just that you can't. What about your husband? He can't read at all. I will spend some extra time with Caleb. But with 14 students of different ages and grades, it's gonna be difficult. Thank you, Mrs. Tyler. I appreciate anything you can do for him. I, uh, you know, Sadie, I could teach you how to read and then you could help Caleb to learn. I, I have to go, Mrs. Tyler. I should have figured it out. The Kens have kept it themselves since they moved into the town. Couldn't have known, Mama. Well, the signs were all there. I just missed them. Hey, Mom. Hey, sis. What's for dinner? Brunswick stew. And it's almost ready, so you boys go and wash up for supper. Uh, can we go to Grandma and Grandpa's for dinner? Not tonight. Go do what your mama said. What does Charles Kent do? Well, George has hired him on part-time at the general store. He does other odd jobs. Mostly wants to get a farm for himself. How did you get all that out of him? Well, I asked him. He doesn't seem very talkative to me. Well, generally, when the sheriff asks questions, people give answers. Mrs. Kent will learn how to read. A whole new world will open up for her. Just like it did for me, Mom, when you taught me how to read. Well, she'd become a different person. Well, maybe that's what her husband's afraid of. What kind of woman allows her husband to dictate to her that way? I wouldn't know, Lindy. I haven't had any experience with that kind. And you never will, Zachary Tyler. Oh. <laughs> Miss! Hello, miss! Is, is there a doctor in town? Yes, you heard? No, not me. My employer, Mrs. Stafford Smythe, has grown gravely ill. We were on the stagecoach passing through when Mrs. Stafford Smythe became ill. I fear for her life. I didn't think she'd make it, miss. How long has she been like this? An hour or so, miss. Whoa, whoa! Thought I got a patient for you. All right, bring her over here on the table. Put her right here. Put her right. That's it. All right. All Watch right. your head. Watch your head. Ooh, ooh. All right. Okay. Her breathing is fine. Pulse is steady. 
Or her skin's claiming to the touch, Doc. Mrs. Stafford Smythe began slurring her words and her sentences didn't make sense. Then she collapsed. You've been drinking? Of course not. Mrs. Stafford Smythe has an occasional glass of sherry, but she is a lady. How long y'all been traveling? We left Beacon Hill nearly two weeks ago. What's she doing out here? Visiting friends in Denver, the Montgomery's, a very prominent family. Do you think she had a stroke, Doc? Why would you say that? I read about the symptoms in Grey's Anatomy. Can you help her, Doctor? Well, unfortunately, I have another patient, possibly a breech birth. But you can't leave Mrs. Stafford Smythe. Well, there's nothing I can do for her until she comes to it. And she seems fairly stable. And there's only one of me. And my other patient's situation is urgent. So uh, if you can just watch out for her until I get back. I'll say, Doc. Well, I don't have much choice, do I? All right, just uh, make sure she's comfortable and keep a close eye on her. And I'll get back as soon as I can. Tyler? Hi, Sadie. I just wanted to talk to you about... Not more in trouble at school? Oh, no. No, nothing like that. I just stopped by to bring some books for Mrs. Kent that I thought she might be interested in. You asked her for books? No, no, she didn't. It's just... I, I thought that... Well, you thought wrong. She got no use for books here. You know, if you got a job you're offering, it's a different story. No, I'm afraid not. Jackson, she's awake. Heavens, Jay. Get up, get up. Mrs. Stafford Smythe, Mrs. Stafford Smythe. My name is Dr. Jackson, and I believe you've had a stroke. My photos, coat, all, all right, Miss. Bags. Hey, calm down, calm down. This is not good for you, ma'am. You have all left. I have your bag, madam, right here. All your things are inside. Our space has obviously been impaired. Well, I don't think it's as bad as it could have been. Hopefully, the slurring will diminish pretty quickly and she'll regain coherent speech. There's some paralysis on her right side. Hmm. But her left side seems unaffected. As soon as she's well enough, I could help her do some movement therapy. I read they're having good results with that. Well, she will need someone with her constantly until we get a better grasp of her physical limitations. I won't leave her side, Doctor. It should be someone with at least rudimentary medical knowledge. <sighs> Belinda, I, do I don't want you to misinterpret this as a permanent job offer, young lady. I haven't changed my mind about women in medicine. So I'd be like your assistant? Not exactly. You will help Mrs. Stafford Smythe with her movement therapy. That is all. I accept. I can do for you, son? Uh, well, yes. I got this problem. Mm -hmm. a, a carbuncle that is driving me crazy. Mm. And you see, the area that's affected has been getting a good deal of sitting time, if you know what I mean. Oh, so you're trying to tell me you got a boil on your backside. All right. Well, bend over the table there and drop your drawers. We'll have a look. That is a mean-looking carbuncle you got there, all right. Uh, would you bring me some of that uh, writer's liniment? It's on the top shelf in there. Uh, would you stop rubbing? I can't help it. Well, the more you scratch it, the itchier it gets. Here you go, Doc. Uh, oh, hey, now. Whoa. <laughs> Wait, never mind. Whoa. Whoa. What about your carbuncle? What carbuncle? Well, at least take the liniment. Belinda. Doctor. You see, that's another reason I can't hire a woman. How am I going to make my money with you scaring away my patients? 
Well, what do you think? Well, let me get this straight. You want to hire Sadie to help you at school so you can teach her to read without her husband knowing? It's an ingenious plan, if you ask me. And just what will you have her do? Whatever needs to be done. She can sweep the floors, clean the blackboards, keep the wood stove burning. Simple things that allow her to learn along with the children. And don't you think the way you're going about this is just a little sneaky? I think the Lord will forgive my methods if I can offer this poor woman a path out of the darkness of ignorance. Lindy, how long is Doc gonna let you stay on at the clinic? As long as Mrs. Stafford Smythe needs me. After that, Doc says they get the boot. You will prove yourself so indispensable that he will never want to let you go. That's the idea. Grandma, there's one too many plates for the table. We have a guest joining us for supper. Hey. Come on in, young man. Let me introduce you to everyone. This is my wife, Marty. Hi. Hi. Daughter, Missy. How do you do? And this is my granddaughter, Belinda. Lindy, this is Mr. Drew Simpson. He inherited Hank's place, and he's come here all the way from New York City. It's a pleasure to meet you, Mr. Simpson. I trust your journey here hasn't left you suffering any adverse effects. Nothing worth speaking of. Well, I'm sure we're all very interested in hearing about your journey. I know I am. Yeah. Come here. We're having a simple dinner, but fried chicken, I hope you like it. Lord, we thank you for the food that's in front of us, the family that surrounds us, and the new friend that's joined us at our table. Amen. Amen. Ah, uh, Jacob, honey, guess first. Would you like a biscuit, Mr. Simpson? Thank you. I'm very sorry about your uncle. He was a wonderful man. But Linda spent quite a bit of time with him these last few weeks. She nursed him right to the very end. That was very kind of you. Well, Lindy's a natural caretaker. In fact, she's working in town with Doc Jackson. I hope to be a doctor someday. Oh, that's rather unusual, isn't it? Pardon me? A woman doctor. It doesn't seem quite appropriate. Appropriate? Why would a lady want to subject herself to such a mentally and physically taxing line of work? Oh, boy. I would think being from New York City, you'd have a more enlightened view of women. And by enlightened, I assume you mean a view that agrees with yours? Ladies are every bit as capable of practicing medicine as men are. I could recommend several recent newspaper articles for you to read. That is, if you're open to being educated. I think you'll find the majority of men uncomfortable being tended to by someone of the weaker sex. That's true. Some men might be so intimidated that they run away in embarrassment. I'm just saying that, like most men, when I marry, I'll need my wife at home. She'll have enough to do just taking care of me and our children. I'm sure she will. More potatoes, anyone? Yes. Please. You're awake. Good. How are you feeling, Mrs. Stafford Smith? Tired. No, don't need help. Your speech is better today. But not my arm. With movement therapy, it's possible to regain use of your arm. Like this. Don't touch me. You're awake, madam. This is wonderful. Don't fuss over me, Winter. Oh, oh sorry, madam. We should let her get some rest. Of course, miss. I'll be in the next room, madam. I won't leave you. I know you won't, Winter. Yeah, great disadvantage if you hadn't been available to help me fix up the place, Mr. Davis. I'd never got it good enough to sell. Glad to do it. Be careful now, you don't catch yourself on a rusty. Ah. Oh, no wire. Ah. Uh, hold on. Let me take a look at it. Ah. We see it. No, it's nothing. We see it. Oh, yeah, that puncture wounds deep. Tell you, the one thing you don't mess around with is rusty wire. You get a nasty infection. I want you to go into town. I want you to see the doc. I'm fine, really. Go on now. I mean, you don't mess with Rust in a gut. I'll finish up here. Yes, sir. All right. Whoa.
afternoon, Mr. Simpson. Good afternoon, Miss Tyler. I came to see Dr. Jackson about my hand. He's out checking on patients. Why, what's wrong? A little run-in with a rusty wire. When do you expect the doctor to return? Not for hours. Rusty wire? Tetanus can take hold pretty quick. Might end up losing the hand. I think you're exaggerating. I understand that you're uncomfortable being tended to by the weaker sex. But unless we clean that wound immediately, it might be too late. Well, y'all could set in by tonight. Although that may not be the worst thing. All right. How much humble pie do I have to eat to persuade you to help me? Just enough to make me believe that you sincerely regret saying that I have no business becoming a doctor. <sighs> I most sincerely regret it. Come inside. My grandpa tells me you went to Columbia University. You didn't mention that the other day at dinner. I guess I could have worked that in when you offered to recommend articles to help enlighten me. That would have been a good time. You're so fortunate to have the opportunity to study at Columbia. I suppose that's true. I can't be a doctor without the proper education. Most hospitals won't even consider me for a nursing position. But the proper education requires a great deal of money. I've been saving for a long time. I'm sorry if it stinks. Oh, no. It's all right. Actually, you've been very gentle. There. You're all set. Remember to keep the wound clean. A at the risk of bringing up an old argument, I must say that you're a bright and beautiful young woman. Beautiful? Yes. <clears throat> anyway, you'll surely be married before long. Uh, why would you want to waste your time preparing for a career that you'll have to leave? Why does every man assume that I'm on a hunt for a husband? Isn't that the goal? Find a mate, settle down, have children? As a lawyer, everything is black or white to you, isn't it? Well, that's, that's rather simplistic. But there is a clear-cut sense of right and wrong in the law that I've come to appreciate. That's why we're different. I see all of God's colors. And somewhere between black and white, it's my dream to be a doctor. I should get back to the ranch. Of course. Please tell my grandpa I said hello. Those sheets are rough. They're all I've got. That cot is like sleeping on a board. And the draft in here practically blows the blanket off my legs. How long until I can leave? You can move to the hotel today, Mrs. Stafford Smythe. If Belinda will stay with you, can you do that? But I thought I'd continue to work here with you. Mrs. Stafford Smythe needs a nurse. I thought that's what you wanted to be. Actually, I want to be a doctor. It's all settled then. That's recess. You're dismissed. You want me to keep an eye on Mrs. Tyler? Yes, thank you, Sadie. Is everything all right? I forgot your lunch today. Oh, you were so sweet to bring it. I am starving. Thank you. I saw Charles Kent this morning. He told me Sadie really enjoys working here. She is learning more and more every day. She's already ahead of Caleb. Now she can help him with his work. I know how much you want to help Sadie, but Charles is a proud man. Pride is a man's downfall, Zach. All I'm saying, Missy, is that he won't take it too well if he finds out she's doing something behind his back. I'll see you tonight. Bye. Winter, is this the best room the hotel has to offer? I'm afraid so, madam. I suppose it's a step up from the clinic. Still, these pillows are much too flat. They'll never do. And surely they got better linen. Oh, oh. I'm mortified by these inferior accommodations, but I'm afraid it's not possible to get anything better in this uncivilized outpost. Oh, Miss Tyler, please come in. Madam, I'll just be down in the restaurant to check on your tea. Wash the china yourself, Windsor. 
I don't trust these people to have high standards of cleanliness. Yes, ma'am. How are you feeling today, Mrs. Stanford Smack? How do you think I'm feeling, being forced to endure these primitive conditions? You know, we're not all uncivilized here. Really? Did I somehow miss seeing the opera house, or a good library, or even a hat shop with the latest fashions from Europe? No? I thought not. Anderson Corner has other things to offer. Such as? Good people, and a church that welcomes everybody, including strangers. And we take care of each other in difficult times. You've never even been outside this small town, have you? Actually, I was born in New York. I didn't come here until I was 14. So I do know a few things about the world outside. But I much prefer Addison Corner. You actually like it here. Compared to New York, it's heaven on earth. I'm gonna miss it terribly when I leave to study to be a doctor. Well, now there's a surprising ambition for a farm girl. I believe it's what God called me to do. God? Ha! Don't put your trust in God, young woman. He is unconcerned with your ambitions. You don't mean that. The only thing you have to rely on in this world is yourself. I must be awful lonely believing in nothing but myself. When you've had a little experience with the harsh realities of life, you'll abandon that naive faith. I've had a great deal of experience of harsh reality. Without my faith, I'd expect I'd be much like you. How's that? Very unhappy. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Hello. Hi. Drew, I'm so glad you could join us for supper. Belinda, I need some eggs, please. All right, Grandma. Everyone here works for their supper. Might as well spit it out. What? Whatever it is you're stewing over. I apologize for being so opinionated and outspoken. You probably can't help it. Can you? <laughs> Not to save my life. <laughs> <laughs> Truce? Truce? Truce. Remember, as I'm moving your arm, you gotta imagine you're doing it on your own, okay? I saw you reading late into the night last night. Oh, I'm so sorry. Did light keep you awake? My age keeps me awake. I'll turn the light out earlier tonight. Must have been a very interesting book to keep you awake at that hour. Oh, it is. It's called The Laws of Life, and it's written by Dr. By Elizabeth Blackwell. You know of her? I heard her speak in Boston. She's a very intelligent woman. I can't imagine what it must be like to hear her speak in person. You sound like you greatly admire her. She's done so much to pave the way for women to become doctors. Ah, and that's what you want to be. I'll be fortunate if I'm able to train to be a nurse. The schooling for doctors is terribly expensive. You moved your arm? Your powers of observation are remarkable. <laughs> It's cause for a cup of tea. Now imagine this is your favorite Earl Grey. See if you can lift your arm enough to take it. What, like a dog doing tricks? Like a woman who wants her independence back. You are a very impertinent young woman. And you are a very difficult patient. If you apply your willfulness to your therapy, you might get better. Done, you can go. Who is Charles Dickens? <laughs> A very talented author. You can borrow the book if you like. Oh, no, thank you. I'll, I'll see you tomorrow, Mrs. Tyler. All right. Boys, look 
can I do for you? Uh, mom needs some flour. All right, what kind? She usually has wheat. Wheat's good. Yeah. All right. Ah! You okay, Mr. Brown? Oh! oh. Mr. Brown! Ah. Dad! Mr. Brown is ill! Oh. George? Doc, George needs to have you take a look at him. He's got a pain that's got he can't even stand up straight. Oh. Hey! Get him up there on the table and have a look at him. Oh! Been vomiting, huh? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, no, you don't have a fever. You've been into the uh, the candy again? Well. Yeah, I thought so. Ah! Well, I gotta get back to the office. If you need anything, let me know, Doc. All right. Thanks, Jack. Bye, Bye Daddy. Uh, would you get my watch over there on the desk, Belinda? Take his pulse. <clears throat> Checking for rebound tenderness? Well, if you're so smart, what am I doing now? Uh, Using McBurney's point method to diagnose with uh, 125. And I suppose you have an opinion. I think he has acute appendicitis. He probably needs surgery. If he has an appendicitis attack, it's not bad enough to warrant surgery. But if his appendix were to burst, I'll... Burst? I, I, just, just, just calm down, George. There's nothing to worry about now. You can get up. All right. Look, if you get... A fever, or if the pain gets considerably worse, you come and see me. Even if it's in the middle of the night. You take a teaspoon of this three times a day till the pain goes away. And George, you stay out of that candy jar. You're a grown man, not a five-year-old. Yes, sir. All right. Much obliged. Listen here, young lady. A good doctor never performs an unnecessary surgery. It's too risky, unless the patient will die without it. But he had all the symptoms. If he had acute appendicitis, George would have been right off this table from the pain. Might even have passed out. Probably has nothing worse than a simple stomach ache. Word. Capture. And this one? Elephant. It says, then they went out to capture the wild elephant. How do you know what that says, Sadie? Mama's learning to read at school with me, Pa. She's real good. Lucky man to have a wife who cooks like Marty does. I am blessed, that's for sure. I thank God every day that he saw fit to put me and Marty together. When did you first know you loved her? That's easy. When I thought I'd never see her again. I felt a terrible emptiness inside of me. And I knew that if I didn't get her back, nothing would ever fill that up again. It's a pretty clear sign. I thought so. What about you, though? Tell me about that life you got to get back to. You got a young lady waiting for you? No. My father thought I should concentrate on school before getting serious about anybody. He may be right. He's always right. Sounds like a man who's pretty sure of himself. If he's ever had a moment's doubt, he hasn't admitted it. Considers it a weakness, I'll bet. Yeah. He says if someone senses weakness in you, that's when they go in for the kill. Yeah, that's a pretty harsh way to look at life. But probably true. In a legal battle, anyway. Ah. Now, we can both go up on that roof. You can find a way to hurt yourself again. Or you can take the wagon into town and pick up those supplies that we ordered. That's an easy choice, sir.
Charles. Yeah. Heard what happened with your wife. I you mean your wife. She tricked me. Well, I'm not apologizing for Missy. She was acting out of kindness and with the honest intent to help. I don't see how this has anything to do with you, Sheriff. Unless there's some new law about reading that I don't know about. You know, Charles, there's no shame in not being able to read. The shame is from not even trying. Hey. I know it hurts, but that's a good sign. I mean, your nerves are kicking back in. If you just try a little bit harder. I am trying. You're giving up too easily. Who do you think you are to talk to me that way? An ignorant, low-class girl in a godforsaken town in the middle of nowhere. I may not have a college education, but I'm well-read and definitely not ignorant. Now, as for class, I come from a good family that could teach you a few things about what that word really means. Get out of my sight! With pleasure. Windsor? Wait up, Miss Belinda. Miss Belinda! I'm sorry, Mr. Windsor. I know you've taken her abuse, but I'm not about to. Mrs. Stafford's wife would never mean to be abusive to you, Miss. I don't know what you call it back east, but out here we call it rude and unacceptable behavior. May I share something of a personal matter with you, Miss Tyler? Something I'd like to show you. This is Benjamin and Lucy, Mrs. Stafford Smythe's children. I thought she didn't have any children. She doesn't now. Oh, I see. Mrs. Stafford Smythe became a widower shortly after Lucy was born, and her children became everything in her life, Miss. What happened to them? Lucy passed away when she was five of the scarlet fever, and Benjamin drowned just before he was to graduate from Harvard. Terrible. When Mrs. Stafford Smythe lost Lucy, the only thing that kept her going was Benjamin. And when she lost him, I was afraid she... So sorry. That explains her anger and bitterness, but that doesn't excuse her behavior. I just want you to understand that Mrs. Stafford Smythe was not always the way she is. She was a kind, generous woman. Try to think of her the way she was before unbearable loss changed her. Try to see her with a forgiving heart and not a judgmental mind. <laughs> Come in. What are you doing back here? I want to apologize to you, Mrs. Stanford Smith. It was inexcusable for me to speak to a patient like that, no matter how challenging you are. This submissive demeanor is out of character for you. Does it have anything to do with Windsor rushing out after you? He told me a little bit about your background, but please do not be angry with him. He knows better than to discuss my private life. He's devoted to you. The only reason he told me is because he believes you need me. I don't need anyone to help me. We all need someone. I lost my mother, father, and baby sister. When I was nine, my little brother Jacob and I had to go live in an orphanage. How did you get here? On an orphan train. They go from town to town, giving kids to whoever want them. Sometimes they're good families, and sometimes they're not. If it wasn't for Missy and Zach, me and Jacob would be separated forever. I'm sorry for you, Belinda. But now you know why I turned from God. No, I don't. How can you still have faith? I know we never really die. I'm connected to the people I love in life, and I know we're still connected in death. A comforting thought if you can believe in fairy tales, which I can't. That's enough for today. I may go.
Belinda. I was visiting my grandma and she wanted me to bring lunch to y'all. Uh, well, your grandpa went into town to pick up some lumber. He should be back soon. I'll just leave this here then. Uh, wait. Why don't you stay and visit a while? I can't. I should be getting back to the clinic. Well, I, well, I was thinking that maybe uh, we could have lunch at the hotel sometime. I'd like that. Tomorrow? Well. Sure. Evening, Charles. Evening, Mr. Davis. Drew Simpson is fixing up his uncle's place. He could use some help. He'll pay you a good wage, and I thought you might be interested in the job. You know, work around my hours at the store? You bet. All right, then. I'll be there after lunch. I'll see you then. All right. Mr. Davis. Thank you, sir. I really appreciate the work. You're welcome, Charles. You're welcome. can't share it. And even if I could, it doesn't change the fact that the only reason I didn't let that stroke kill me is my distant relatives who are just waiting for me to die so that they can inherit my fortune. I think the whole reason your stroke didn't kill you is because God has work for you. To find a purpose by loving other people. And losing them. The fact that you grieve deeply means you love deeply. There are so many people out there who need what you have. Who would that be? At the orphanage, there's hundreds of children without parents or parents who just simply give them away. Ah, so you're suggesting I give money? Not just money, yourself. You have so much love to give and they need love. Aren't we supposed to be practicing? Reach for the teacup. One hand. Best cup of tea I ever had. <laughs> Hold it right there. Okay. That'll do it. <laughs> Thanks again, Charles. I'm not sure what I would have done without you. Uh, you're more than welcome, Mr. Simpson. Drew. All right, Drew. Can I ask you a question about the law? Sure. It's about adoption. You and your wife thinking about adopting a child? Well, not exactly. Sadie was married before we met. Her first husband it was Caleb's pa. But he was a real no account. He used to beat Sadie and Caleb both. She divorced him? Yeah. He got in a bar fight. Then he hurt some fellow real bad and put him in prison. Gave Sadie a chance to get away, but he's fixing to get out soon. And I know he's gonna come looking for Caleb. Now, if I can adopt him, does that make him my boy? And ain't nobody can take him away? That's right. Sadie's awful worried that he won't give up his claim to Caleb. Well, under normal circumstances, he'd have to agree to it. But because he's been in prison, there's no way the court would favor him over you. You sure about that? Well, I'll draw up the papers to petition the court. We'll see what the judge has to say. Well, now, I can't pay you right now, but I... You don't I'll... have to. Well, I don't take charity. Consider it uh, part of your wages for working here. Like uh, a bonus for doing a really good job. 
All right. Thank you, Drew. It's my pleasure, Charles. I just passed the bar. I'll take those for you When folks. I return home, I'll join my father's practice. Does he practice criminal law? Uh, nothing nearly so unsavory. No, he handles mostly contracts, wills, trusts, that sort of thing. My father represents some of the wealthiest people in New York. So you only be helping the rich people? Well, that's who our clients are. They don't have to be. You could help the less fortunate. We work with people who pay our fees. Is that all you care about? Thank you. Money? <laughs> don't be ridiculous. That's not what I meant. <laughs> well, it seems to me you don't have a real passion for law. Well, the definition of law is reason free from passion. Do you have time to take a walk? I should be getting back to Miss Stafford tonight. A short one. So do you really want to be a lawyer? Was it simply expected of you? It was always understood that I would follow in my father's footsteps, yes. What does your mother think? Doesn't her opinion matter? Her opinion would matter a great deal if she was still alive. She died when I was eight. Oh, I had no idea. I'm so sorry, Drew. You know, for a long time after she died, I used to play this little game every time I left the house. I'd pretend that when I came home, she'd be there, hiding somewhere, waiting for me to find her. <laughs> of course, the only thing I ever found was the latest governess my father had hired. He gave me every material advantage I could ever hope for. The only thing I ever wanted was my mother to be there when I came home. You're privileged to have both your parents. Actually, I was adopted. I would have never guessed they're not really your family. I mean, <laughs> not that. <laughs> it's, it's all right. First, I didn't feel like they were my family. And they made me realize that loving someone has nothing to do with being related. Everything to do with opening their heart and letting someone in. I envy the relationship you have with your family. Why? You really love each other. I haven't felt that since my mother died. That sense of security, of knowing that... Knowing that someone will always be there for you and never be completely on your own again. Yes. Exactly. You see? <laughs> <laughs> You have made remarkable progress, <laughs> Mrs. Stafford Smythe. I must say, I am very impressed. To be truthful, I wasn't sure you'd regain use of your arm. Nor did I think so, but Belinda was stubborn about my therapy. She listened to me grouse and complain, but she never gave up on me. She's a remarkable young woman, don't you think, Doctor? Yes, yes, she is. Uh, indeed, remarkable. I know you must be anxious to get back to Boston, and I think you can start planning to go home now. Oh, thank you, Doctor. So, what did you ride all the way out here to ask your grandma? Seems while I wasn't looking, my life just got really complicated. This wouldn't have anything to do with Drew Simpson, would it? I'm attracted to him, and it's not fair. To you or to him? Both. He's becoming a distraction. I can't let that happen. Everything seems to be getting a lot harder all of a sudden. Only a few years ago, I knew just how to get answers to my questions. You wish it was simple again, like when you were a child? You could say a heartfelt prayer to God and then just listen for his guidance. Yes. Belinda, it's still that simple. Drew, you want to take a break? What? Oh, no, no, no. I'm, I'm fine. <laughs> Something weighing on your mind? No, nothing. Have you ever had that experience where you think a person is one way and they turn out to be something else entirely? I think we've all had that experience at one time. I, I had Belinda all figured out. Then I get thrown for a loop. And that's bad. Well, it's complicated. She makes me think about things I thought were all settled. Such as? Where I'm going to live, what I'm going to do, even whether or not my life has any real meaning or purpose. A woman can do that to a man. I know what I want to do with my life. 
want to sell this place, go back to New York, go into my father's firm, get married, and raise a family. Well, in that case, what is the problem? Belinda is the problem. I don't want to think about her. I don't want to get involved with her. She's nothing like the kind of woman I have planned for my future. She wants a career in a man's field. She's opinionated, outspoken, strong-willed, smart, kind. That doesn't sound like a problem, son. That sounds like an opportunity. It's broken. There ought to be a law against giving you a hammer, son. For your information, the first time I hurt myself, it was on a wire. Well, maybe you should stick to lawyering. Hmm. Belinda, why don't you uh, look at the boy's hand? Can you bend it? I guess I can. I think it's just a bruise. I can splint it if it's broken. It might be quite cumbersome. Just leave it. Have lunch at the hotel with me today. I'm sorry, I can't. Tomorrow, then? I have Mrs. Stafford's mat to tend to. Well, maybe we can find time Do you to... want the splint? What? No. No splint. And excuse me, I have work to finish. Drew, I have things to do. Why are you being like this? What happened? I don't know what you mean. Yes, you do. When the farm sells, you'll be moving back to New York, right? Well, yes. And I'll be staying here. So where does that leave us? You'll go back to a life I can barely imagine. Meeting with rich clients in a big office. Going to fancy balls with orchestras. Dancing with well-bred girls in satin gowns. After a while, you won't even remember me. Hand me that place. Come on, Would you like to join us, Charles? Oh, no, thank you, ma'am. I just came to drop this by. It's for Miss Belinda. Seems Drew hurt himself again. I better go check on him. I'll be back as soon as I can, Mama. Thank you, Charles. Sure. I believe this belonged to my aunt. Probably meant a great deal to my uncle. This isn't a fancy ballroom. There isn't an orchestra. But if I can have this dance, 
I promise you, Belinda, I will never forget it. You know this doesn't change anything, Drew. I think it changes everything. I should go in. I'll see you tomorrow. I don't think... Tomorrow. Dr. Jackson has given me the go-ahead to travel home to Boston. I'm very happy for you, Mrs. Stafford Smart, but I am gonna miss you. I'd like you to come with me, Belinda. If you're worried about the travel, I mean, Mr. No, I'm not looking for a traveling companion. I'd like you to come back to Boston and live with me. Take me to that orphanage. I'd like to meet those children. You don't need me to take you there. I'll just get you the name no, of the orphanage. Oh, well, Belinda, there's more. I would like to pay your way through college and medical school. You shouldn't have to settle for small dreams. Dare to go for the big ones. You'll make a fine doctor, Belinda. <laughs> That's a much too generous offer, Mrs. Stafford Smythe. I'm afraid I, I can't accept it. Why on earth not? Because it, it'd take me years and years to pay you back. Well, it's not a loan, it's a gift. I'm a very wealthy woman. I can afford to do this for you. I would like to think if my Lucy had lived, she might have grown up to be just like you, Belinda. Even if I could accept your offer, they'd never accept me into a good college. I mean, most of the schools don't even allow women. Oh, posh. I'll just send up a smoke signal to my friend Sam Gregory and... Dr. Sammy Gregory? The Dr. Sammy Gregory founded Boston University School of Medicine? Yes. One in the same. I don't know what to say. Well, say yes. Thank you, Mrs. Stafford Smythe. Thank you. Oh. I know that you'll need to talk this over with your family. But when I leave next week, I hope you'll be with me. <laughs> I think it is the opportunity of a lifetime, Lindy. But Boston is very far away. And we'd certainly miss you. And I'm gonna miss you. And Papa and Grandpa and Maddie and Jacob. I can't leave Jacob. Oh, we'll take good care of him. Besides, we all knew that you were going to have to leave Anderson Corner one day if you were going to get a good education. It scares me about thinking of leaving everyone. When I came out here from back east, I was scared too. So was I. When I left with my first husband, Willie, I had no idea what lay ahead. The only thing I knew was that I was leaving the only home I'd ever known. How'd you both do it? When you face the unknown, you have to gather every ounce of courage you possess and then tell yourself that if it's the right thing to do, everything will work out fine. And if it doesn't, you can always come home. So you think I should go? I think you should do what your mom and I both did. Pray about it. And then decide. Wonderful surprise. I can only say a moment, Drew. Something entirely unexpected has happened, and I wanted to let you know. Oh, I hope it's something good. Actually, it's amazing. Mrs. Stafford Smythe has asked me to go to Boston with her. She's going to put me through school. That's incredible. I, I know what it must mean to you. You know Boston isn't that far from New York. Maybe we can... That's just it, Drew. No, we can't. Why not? As soon as I get my medical degree, I'll be coming back here, practicing with Doc and hopefully taking over for him someday. You may change your mind when you get to Boston. It has a great deal to offer. It doesn't have what Anderson Corner does. My family, people who really need me, they probably won't have a doctor when Doc's gone. Linda, we can work this out. I've thought hard about this, Drew. I've prayed even harder. 
I would never fit into your world. My life is here. The only way we could be together if one of us is miserable. Belinda. I said what I came here to say. Belinda. Belinda! Jonas Barnes. He hurt his leg recently. Gangrene set in. It's gonna have to come off at the knee. Will surgery save his life? Mm, with gangrene? I don't know. But if I don't do it, he'll die within the day. I can help. Linda, this is life-threatening, gruesome surgery. I can handle it, Doc. Cora, I need you to wait outside. I'll come and get you as soon as we're done. All right, Jonas. I think we're ready to start. I mean, maybe you could say a little prayer first. Of course. I'm Belinda. Lord, we are eternally grateful that you're here with us now. And pray that you bless Doc with a steady hand and bless Jonas with a peaceful heart and Cora with the knowledge that you are in control of this day. Amen. 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 All right. I need you to lay back there now. Everything's gonna be all right. Count to ten with me, okay? Okay. One. One. Two. Two. Three. Three. Four. Four. He's out. This starts the process to make you legally Caleb's father. I'll just need you to sign there, and then I'll file the paper with the court. You really think the judge will grant the adoption? I can't guarantee it, but it should be an open and shut case. Your turn, Charles. Can I sign for Charles? Well, I'm afraid not. You just put your X right there. You know, you're my first client. Now, if you'll excuse me, I need to be going. Thank you so much, Drew. I really appreciate it. You're more than welcome. Thank you, Sadie. Charles, we haven't talked about what happened with Caleb. I, I want to explain. No, you don't have to, Sadie. I'm sorry I went behind your back, but I don't understand why you don't want me to learn to read. I reckon if you learned how to read, you'd see that there's a whole lot more out there than what I can give you and Caleb. Charles, you are the finest man I've ever known. I don't know what Caleb and I would have done without you. Oh, Sadie, I love you both so much. And I'd be mighty proud to give Caleb my name. 
but I, I wonder if he's going to be ashamed of me. You know what would make your son proud of you, Charles? Seeing that his father had the courage to do something very hard, and all because he loves his son so much. If I can do it, I know you can, Charles. It would be nice to be able to read that piece of paper that says I'm Caleb's pa. I think she might teach us together. <laughs> <laughs> It's gonna be all right. It's gonna be all right. Listen to me, Jonas. You have to relax. Jonas! Shh, shh, shh. All right. Shh, shh, shh. You have to relax. Jonas. Oh, Jonas. Please don't do it. Oh. Go outside, please. <laughs> you poor dear. Oh, I tried, Grandma. I really did. He was so strong. How could he be so strong after what he went through? He was very frightened. Fear can do that. I haven't seen anyone die since my mom and baby sister. So horrible to see the life drain out of him so fast. I'm so sorry, darling. It was so awful. It wasn't your fault, Belinda. <laughs> it's okay. It must be hard on him to lose a patient he's tried so desperately to save. But once he gets past the sadness and frustration he must feel, he will tell you it wasn't your fault. If it wasn't my fault, then why do I feel like it is? Because you care deeply about people, and that's what makes you hurt for them. And that is also what will make you a good doctor. I don't think I'm cut out to be a doctor after all. I'll just stay here and be Doc's assistant if let me. Belinda, you can't mean that. I'm afraid I do. No. Oh. Hello, Mrs. Stavridge, mind? Did you tell Belinda it was her fault that poor man died? Of course not. Did you tell her it wasn't? Well, you don't mean that I didn't think... Exactly. Yeah. All right. That ought to do it. <laughs> I don't think you have any trouble finding a buyer now. I already know the buyer I want. Charles. Would you and Sadie like to take this place? Oh, we can never afford a place like this. You could if I loaned you the money. 
You can never accept a loan that big. What if we called it a mortgage? Except you can pay it off as you can. In a way, I owe you, Charles. You showed me how good it feels to practice the law when I'm helping someone who really needs it. So, Charles, what do you say? Will you take this place off my hands for me? Yes. Yes, I will. Thank you. Thank You're you. welcome. Oh, this place is Thank you. to have let you down, but you were right. I don't have what it takes to be a doctor. Oh. Can I help? She can barely breathe. We have to get her to dock. Where's the doctor? Uh, he's not here. Belinda, I need your help. <gasps> you have to help her. She's turning blue. I don't know what to do, Caroline. I'm sorry. You're her only chance right now. I can't be responsible for Sally's life. This is your destiny, right? This is what God wants from you. You have to believe that, Belinda. I do. Trouble breathing. What is it? What's wrong with my baby? It could be a number of things. If my diagnosis is wrong. Please, Belinda. You gotta open your mouth, all right? There's some abscess in the area around the tonsils. What does that mean? I don't know. It could be Quincy. Is there some kind of medicine for it? No. There's only one thing to do. I have to land her throat. Then do it! Helen, I've never done this procedure before or anything like this. I'll help you. Whatever I can do. What can I do? Okay, get the tray and get the mask. Okay, wet this. Put this on her mouth for five seconds. Five seconds. One. One. Two. the other way. I could have lost your Drew. But you didn't. You were smart enough to figure out what to do and brave enough to do it. I was terrified the whole time. It didn't stop you. Oh, Belinda, I have been looking all over for you. What's happened? What is it? Belinda saved my daughter's life. All right, now open up for me. Well, I bet that throat is 
really sore, huh? Good excuse for your mama to churn some fresh buttermilk for you. I sure will. <laughs> you know, you saved her life. But I didn't save Jonas's. Yes, um, about that. I owe you a very big apology. Jonas's death wasn't your fault. But I couldn't hold him still. But that's not why he died. Jonas was dying when he came to us. We were trying to save him, but unfortunately, the surgery was just too much for him. I told you how difficult it is losing a patient. I've been practicing for 40 years, give or take. That never gets any easier. When it hurts this much, it just means that you care that much more about your patients. I don't think I'm cut out to be a doctor. Oh, yes, you are, young lady. You go back to Boston with Mrs. Stafford Smythe. But you just make darn sure that you come back here when you're a doctor. Start crying, or else I'll think I made a mistake after all. That's for having more faith in me than I had in myself. to see you off the stagecoach? I'd rather we say goodbye here. You know, by train, Boston isn't as far as it once seemed. Mm-hmm. Are you all right, Belinda? Yes, Mom, I'm fine. No second thoughts about leaving with Mrs. Stafford Smythe? No, not anymore. I feel at peace with my decision. So your second thoughts are about Drew? I love him, Mama. I really do never work. Sometimes one dream is all you can have. Whoa. I just wanted to say goodbye, Clark. And thank you for everything. You headed home? Charles and Sadie are moving on to the farm. I'm headed back to New York tomorrow. I uh, imagine Belinda left. We said our goodbyes at Missy this morning. She's probably getting on the stage right about now. You asked me once when I knew I loved Marty, but you never asked me what I did about it. What was that? She left on a wagon train. She's going back home. I went after her. Do you love someone? Do you truly love them? You don't let them go. I've learned a lot from you, Clark. Then what are you doing still standing here? Don't you have a stage to catch? Practice in Boston while you're in school, then we'll come back here. You'd be happy practicing law in Anderson Corner? Anderson Corner is the place I learned to love the law, and it has you. I don't think I could be truly happy anywhere else. 
This isn't your world, Drew. You're my world. I love you, Belinda. Marry me. Oh, there's a train back to Boston most every day. You'll get one next week. Windsor will meet you at the depot, won't you, Windsor? I'd love to marry you, Drew. Andrew, take Belinda to be your lawfully wedded wife, to have and to hold, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, forsaking all others, till death do you part? I do. And you, Belinda, take Andrew to be your lawfully wedded husband, to have and to hold, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, forsaking all others, till death do you part? I do. I now pronounce you man and wife. Ready? 